Okay, so, uh, welcome to this next video in which we are discussing pain and analgesic drugs. Okay, so in this video what we're going to discuss is the mechanism of action of the local anaesthetics. Okay, right. Uh, so the first thing I want to discuss is what is the difference between an anaesthetic and an analgesic. Well, there isn't really that much difference. There is obviously huge difference in um, the targets of the, of the drugs, okay? Uh, but local anaesthetics uh, and analgesics are both drugs uh, which reduce pain, basically. Okay, so local anaesthetics are going to work uh, by blocking voltage-gated sodium channels, okay? And what we want to explore in this video is what is understood of why blocking voltage-gated sodium channels in this way doesn't kill you, okay? And the answer really is that these drugs amazingly manage to just block action potentials in neurons which are firing action potentials too rapidly, okay? So it manages to just block neurons that are firing action potentials too rapidly and not to block all neurons, because if it blocked the firing of all action potentials down all neurons, that would obviously kill you, okay? But these drugs manage to just block neurons that are trying to fire action potentials too rapidly, basically. Okay, and the nociceptive afferents are guilty of that in inflammatory pain, or indeed if you're undergoing a uh, surgical procedure, then of course you're going to be being exposed to prolonged stimuli which have the potential to cause tissue damage, okay? Uh, so if you're having your skin cut into, for instance, that's going to be activating a lot of uh, nociceptors, and they're going to be firing very, very rapidly, okay? And that's the basis for how these drugs work, that they can stop those neurons that are going to fire too rapidly without blocking uh, all neurons from firing um, at all, okay? So it's only going to block the neurons which fire too rapidly. Okay, so we want to try and understand the mechanism by which local anaesthetics only block neurons that fire too rapidly. And I should say that this is still an area of active research, so I'm going to show you a potential mechanism for how this occurs, but there is growing evidence that potentially the mechanism is different from what I'm going to tell you, but this is still the leading model that makes the most sense. Okay, right. Uh, so. In order to understand this, we need to know a little bit more about voltage-gated sodium channels. We need to understand that there are three different states for voltage-gated sodium channels to be in, in order to understand what local anaesthetics are going to do. Okay, so, we'll start with the first state. So the first state is the closed state, which is also called the resting state of the voltage-gated sodium channel. Okay, and I'll draw the closed state like so. So this is the closed or resting state, and this is the state that voltage-gated sodium channels are going to be in when the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is at the resting level of negative 65 millivolts. Okay, so this is a non-conductive state. The voltage-gated sodium channels are not at the moment letting any uh, sodium ions move through them. Okay, then what we know is that if we depolarize the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, we can make the voltage-gated sodium channel go from being in the closed uh, or resting state to being in an open state. So let me show you this here. Okay, and this state is conducting. This will allow sodium ions to move in. Okay, so this is now the open state. And to do this, we need to take the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane up to depolarized of negative 40 millivolts. It needs to be something greater than negative 40 millivolts beyond threshold potential. And then the voltage-gated sodium channels will move into this open state, which is a conducting state, and which will allow sodium ions to move from the extracellular fluid into uh, the intracellular fluid. Okay, so this allows sodium ions to move through. Okay, and this obviously is extremely important in the upstroke of the action potential. So let me just draw a little picture of the action potential out again, because this is so, so important. So here we'll have membrane electrical potential difference on the uh, y-axis and time on the x-axis. So we start off 
at an electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of negative 65 millivolts, that's a bit of a squash, and then we have the initial depolarization up to negative 40 millivolts, and then of course the voltage-gated sodium channels open at negative 40 millivolts, and they cause the upstroke of the action potential, so it's this excitatory current coming in here that's going to cause this upstroke here. Okay, but then an extraordinary phenomenon occurs. The voltage-gated sodium channels start to close, even though the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is most definitely still depolarized of negative 40 millivolts, which is all the way down here. Okay, so this phenomenon is known as inactivation. Basically, if you maintain the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane at a level that is depolarized of the threshold potential, the voltage-gated sodium channels do not, absolutely do not, just remain in the open state. Instead, they go into a third state, which is known as the inactivated state, Okay, which is another non-conducting state, but it's a very different non-conducting state to the uh, closed state. Basically what happens is a cytoplasmic portion of the voltage-gated sodium channel bends back and blocks the pore of the voltage-gated sodium channel like so. And this portion of the voltage-gated sodium channel which bends back like this and blocks the pore is known as the inactivation gate. Okay, right, so let's color this in. So here is the main pore portion of the voltage-gated sodium channel, and then there is this portion known as the inactivation gate that folds back, it's usually in the cytoplasmic portion, and it folds back and blocks the channel from the intracellular aspect. And again, this is a non-conducting state, but it's very different to this non-conducting state here. We are still depolarized here. Okay, when you've got this, you're still depolarized of negative 40 millivolts. Okay, and this is why the voltage-gated sodium channels close here. They're going into the inactivated state. Okay, and they're no longer conducting sodium ions into the cell. Okay, right. Then, of course, you get the repolarization phase of the action potential, which is caused by totally different ion channels, the voltage-gated potassium channels. And then they, too, close. Again, a similar phenomenon. They inactivate. Okay, and then um, now... Both the voltage-gated sodium channels and the voltage-gated potassium channels are both closed uh, and uh, normal equilibrium procedures will return the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane to resting uh, membrane potential. Okay, right. So, what we now want to discuss is how do those inactivated uh, voltage-gated sodium channels go back to being in the closed slash resting state so that when uh, you depolarize the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane again, uh, you can fire another action potential. And this really is the key here, okay? Um, basically, when you repolarize the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane back down to resting membrane potential, this causes the inactivation gate to come out of the channel. Okay, so temporarily it then goes back into the open state, so it's a flash basically. It flashes into the open state, and then of course, because you're back at negative 65 millivolts, or even beyond that maybe for this little hyperpolarized portion here, uh, the um, open state will go back into the closed state. Okay, so these two conversions are made when you repolarize the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, and they are absolutely key for getting you ready to fire another action potential. Okay, and it's this step that the voltage-gated sodium channels are going to interfere, sorry, that the local anesthetics are going to interfere with, basically, this returning of the inactivated channels to the closed slash resting state. Okay, right. So, let's firstly start off with some examples of local anesthetics, and in fact I'm only going to give you one example, which is the famous drug lidocaine, uh, also known as lignocaine. Okay, lignocaine is its old name, so uh, you might hear it referred to that occasionally. Okay, right. Uh, so, 
how do these drugs work? Well, firstly, there is a term that people throw around all the time when discussing uh, local anaesthetics, and that's the term use-dependent block of the voltage-gated sodium channels. So what does a use-dependent block of the voltage-gated sodium channels mean? Okay, use-dependent block means that the drug cannot bind to the voltage-gated sodium channel unless it's being used. Okay, so the drug can't bind to the closed slash resting state of the voltage-gated sodium channel. Okay, it can only bind to the voltage-gated sodium channel when the voltage-gated sodium channel gets used and therefore goes into the open state and then the drug can bind. So let me describe this in more detail. So basically, local anesthetics are believed to go into the intracellular fluid and then enter the pore from the intracellular side. Okay, and lidocaine is no exception there. Okay, so lidocaine is believed to go into the intracellular fluid, okay, and then when the voltage-gated sodium channel goes into the open state, and only when it goes into the open state, then uh, the drug can gain access to the pore, and it can get stuck in the pore, basically, okay, and it will bind in the pore. Okay, so here is our lidocaine molecule now stuck in the pore there. Okay, and this basically then blocks the voltage-gated sodium channel from conducting any more sodium ions. So, hence why it's called a use-dependent block. It only blocks the voltage-gated sodium channel once it has opened. Okay, it's not like those pesky magnesium ions for the NMDA receptor, which are blocking the pore even before the pore has actually opened. Okay, no, the drug only binds once it's actually opened. Okay, and that's quite important. We'll come back to that later on. Okay, then what's going to happen is the voltage-gated sodium channel is now going to go into the inactivated state. Okay, so once again, the inactivation gate will come in. So let me draw this now. The drug molecule will still be bound there. Here it is. And now the inactivation gate is down here, and that's also blocking the channel. So the channel is effectively double blocked by both the drug molecule and the inactivation gate. Okay, and now what's believed to happen is the binding of the drug molecule there is believed to stabilize the inactivated state. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean that if you now take the electrical potential difference back down to negative 65 millivolts, okay, i.e. repolarize the electrical potential difference, this complex here where you've got the inactivated channel with the lidocaine molecule there or some other local anesthetic molecule, that's going to take much longer to return back into the closed state. Okay, so the drug molecule stabilizes the inactivated state. You'll hear that term thrown around as well. Okay, um, so that means that this is now going to take much longer to go back into the closed slash resting state. So to go back into the closed resting state, what needs to happen is the drug molecule needs to cleave off and the inactivation gate will cleave off at roughly the same time and both of them together will then leave the pore, okay? And then it will return back into the open state transiently and uh, then back into the closed state. Okay, right. So, believe it or not, we actually have everything we now need to understand why these only block neurons from firing too rapidly. Uh, sorry, only block neurons that are firing too rapidly and not neurons that are firing uh, at a respectable pace. Okay, so let's think about this by showing uh, the free nerve ending of our nociceptor here. Okay, so remember, the right end of the free nerve ending is the portion where the receptor potential is generated. This is the portion where these um, nociceptive receptors are um, situated, and these will be responding to noxious stimuli. And when the noxious stimulus is present, uh, then that will cause the channel to open, and it will allow in, generally, sodium ions into the cell, which will cause that initial depolarizing current, which is going to cause the initial depolarization to produce the action potential. Okay, so let me just color in uh, this receptor here in red. Okay, right. Uh, now let's have the portion that's actually going to fire the action potential over here. Okay, and now it's important to acknowledge that there are loads of voltage-gated sodium channels here, so I'm going to draw a few of them here. So here's one, Here's another one, here's another one. Uh, oh, sorry, that, that's just one. And then here's a final one here. 
Okay, so I'll colour these in in blue. Okay, so now let's imagine that we um, that we dip our free nerve ending here in lidocaine. Okay, so we expose it to lidocaine. Okay, but at the moment it's not fired an action potential yet. Okay, so we're just setting this up. We've put lidocaine in here. Okay, but at the moment none of the drug molecules are bound because all of these channels would be in the closed state. I know I've drawn them in the open state, but they would be in the closed state before an action potential has actually um, fired. Okay, so at the moment no drug molecules are bound. Okay, then what we're going to do is we're going to stimulate the free nerve ending with a noxious stimulus which will produce the receptor potential. Okay, some of this excitatory current will diffuse into this area here where we're going to have the action potential originating. So this is the action potential origin. Okay, and now what's going to happen, the voltage gated sodium channels are going to open. Okay, so they're going to go into the open state, and then lidocaine molecules are going to block them. But here's the really important thing to understand. Lidocaine does not bind to the voltage-gated sodium channels instantly. Okay? It takes time for it to get into the channel and block it. And in that time that it takes for it to actually block the voltage-gated sodium channel, you're going to have let in a lot of sodium, okay? So that's a really important point to understand. The drug molecule does bind the, block the channel, but, you know, these voltage-gated sodium channels let in sodium at an incredibly fast rate, you know, a huge, huge rate, okay? So that time that it takes for the drug molecule to get on is not insignificant. So in fact, you don't really block the upstroke of the action potential that badly, okay? You will lessen it to a little bit, but actually, here's the initial depolarization produced by this current coming here, okay? The upstroke of the action potential will not be too badly damaged, basically. It will be like so this, maybe lessened a little bit, but not too badly. Okay, right. However, now what has happened is these voltage-gated sodium channels now do have lidocaine molecules bound to them. And then when they go into the inactivated state here, they will go into this new state here where the drug molecule is going to stabilize them in that state. Okay, then of course the voltage-gated potassium channels will do their bit and you'll take it back down like so. Okay, and now, now comes the important bit. Okay, now it takes much longer for these uh, voltage-gated sodium channels in this inactivated state stabilized by the binding of the lidocaine to actually return back into the resting state. So, let's think about what would happen if you waited a long time before firing another action potential, but before stimulating the free nerve ending again. Okay, so let's wait a long time, then of course what's going to happen is eventually these uh, inactivated state voltage-gated sodium channels will return back to the closed resting state. Okay, the drug molecule and the inactivation gate will come out and they'll go back to being in the closed state. And then you're back at the original square one. Okay, you're back where we were originally. You've got lidocaine molecules in the intracellular fluid, but all of your voltage-gated sodium channels are in the um, closed resting state and they're ready to fire an action potential. And then if you do actually um, initiate a noxious stimulus here, to cause the depolarizing current here that will lead to an action potential, then you will get a pretty normal action potential. And the important thing to note about this action potential is that the amount of sodium current you're going to let in here is big enough that the action potential can propagate. That's a really important point that I didn't stress enough when we were actually discussing this initially. Okay. You have lessened the sodium current that comes in by the lidocaine molecules going in and blocking these, but it's not that significant, okay? And it's not significant enough to actually block uh, enough sodium coming in for the action potential to propagate. So remember, the way that the action potential propagates is that when the sodium comes in at this portion that's undergoing the action potential, that sodium diffuses into the intracellular fluid of the neighbouring portion of membrane and that then causes the initial depolarization that leads to that portion of membrane firing an action potential. Okay, so you need to let in sufficient sodium that it's actually capable of spreading the action potential to the neighbouring portion and basically the lidocaine drug molecule does not block uh, 
the voltage gated sodium channels quick enough to stop enough sodium coming in to actually block the progression of the action potential. So the action potential does propagate up and the neuron does function. Okay? And going back to this point of if you wait long enough, if you wait long enough, you'll go back to square one and you will then be able to fire an action potential again. So if you wait long enough, it doesn't matter that these uh, voltage-gated sodium channels have been stabilized in this inactivated state. They will have moved back to the closed resting state. They don't remain like that forever. They do eventually move back into the closed resting state. So if you wait long enough before you try and stimulate another action potential, it will be absolutely fine. Again, you're back to square one. All of your voltage-gated sodium channels along your entire axon will be back in the resting state. And again, it's exactly the same process that I've just described. Um, the voltage-gated sodium current will be reduced, but it's not reduced sufficiently enough to hugely disfigure the action potential. And really importantly, it's not decreased enough to stop the propagation of the action potential on. And that's the key thing about neurons, the propagation of the action potential. Okay, it doesn't matter that the action potential is slightly disfigured. The job of an action potential is to propagate up the neurons so that we can send a signal. So if propagation is fine, then everything's fine. So that's why this drug doesn't damage firing of action potentials in neurons that are not trying to fire action potentials too rapidly. Now, let's contrast that to what will happen in neurons which are trying to fire action potentials too rapidly. Okay, so let's say this one wants to fire an action potential really quickly after just firing that action, that first action potential. Okay, so we've done the same setup. We've got our free nerve ending here. Okay, we put our lidocaine molecule on. We stimulate it to fire an action potential. Okay, and the first one's fine. That will propagate. But now we stimulate it again too quickly. Okay, very rapidly after the first one. Now, what does that mean? Well, if we stimulate it too rapidly, these voltage-gated sodium channels that are in this stabilized and activated state will not have had time to move back into the closed resting state. Or at least a huge fraction of them won't have. Some of them will have managed to move by now. Okay, so a small fraction of them will. So let's say this one here has managed to move back into the closed resting state, but the other two here have not had time to move back into the closed resting state. Okay, so now what's going to happen is you're going to depolarize the electrical potential difference here, okay, by the initial excitatory current. You are going to activate this small fraction of them that have um, gone back into the closed resting state. That will cause a tiny little rise, maybe like this, okay. Another important point we need to do, dwell on is that these ones now are not going to be even trying to go back into the closed state now because we are depolarized. Remember, you only try to move back into the closed state once you are repolarized, so they're not even going to be trying to move back into the closed state anymore. These ones will open. They will then get the drug molecule bind binding to them. They'll then go into the inactivated state, and they too now will be in a stabilized inactivated state. So you will return all of your voltage-gated sodium channels back into this stabilized inactivated state. And moreover, this tiny little sodium current that you've let in here is not big enough to actually propagate forward. So the whole neuron is not going to fire an action potential, basically. Okay, so that is how you block these neurons from firing action potentials if they're trying to fire them too rapidly. And again, if you now try to fire another action potential after that second one, again, the same thing will happen. It will get blocked because if you don't wait long enough, you're back at this um, position where not enough of your voltage-gated sodium channels are in the resting closed state for you to let in enough sodium current that the action potential can propagate up the axon. Okay, so basically all that happens is if you're continuously trying to fire these action potentials, all you achieve is continuously re-blocking the few voltage-gated sodium channels that have managed 
to move back into the closed resting state and they are not capable of letting in enough sodium for you to actually get an action potential propagating up the axon. Okay, and that's why neurons that are trying to fire action potentials too rapidly are completely blocked because all they keep doing is re-blocking their voltage-gated sodium channels and in this process of re-blocking them they let in a bit of sodium but it's not enough to actually produce an action potential that's capable of propagating up this uh, axon basically. Okay, so that's why uh, rapidly firing neurons get their action potentials blocked whereas slowly firing neurons do not get their action potentials blocked. Okay, right. Uh, so that's the mechanism then by which local anesthetics are believed to work and how they only block neurons that are firing too rapidly and don't block neurons that are firing at a reasonable rate. In the next video, what we'll turn our attention onto is the mechanism of the opiate drugs.